There it goes. Okay, very good. All right, sorry. Thank you. All right, good to have you. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Frank. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so I was asked to, to give this talk on, on jets, and I was asked to try to keep it simple as possible. I hope I, I managed. Maybe I will be a little bit abstract at the end, but uh, uh, the first half or the first three quarter of the talk is, I guess it's rather simple and and probably you heard many of the elements and uh, but I think it's good to to go through again. Okay, so let's talk about jets. So first thing first, uh, what are jets? And uh, so from a experimentalist point of view, and if you have a nice picture, for example, from this uh, Atlas experiment. I know this is not a new plot, it's from 2011, as you can see, but uh, you can see in the colorimeter and metric cells and in the tracking detector, and even in this Lego plot. So you can, what you can see, you can identify a certain, certain structure. So, so for example, if you look at this detailed plot in the, uh, in the, this Lego plot, this is the rapidity, azimuthal angle, and PT. So you can see two significant towers and many other, many small PT activity in, in the detector. And, and since, since this, the whole hadronic activity is really concentrated in these two, two cells, basically two calorimetric cells. So you can, and if you, if you see the tracks, you can say, okay, they, that looks something like like jets, like collinear uh, hadrons going into the same direction. So that's what you can observe. And of course, if you have another event, a more complex event, you, you you might be able to identify actually say more jets. So more these collinear hadrons or spray spray of hadrons in, in, in into one direction. And and for example, in this case actually it was reconstructed six jets in, in the Atlas that I thought. So, so we, we, can, we can see such a phenomena in the detector. And of course, if, if there is such a structure, such a non-trivial structure, we would like to understand what happens and we, we would like to try to describe with theory and, uh, and, and of course, predict uh, 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 cert certain cross-sections. So what are jets? So what we can observe, the, the, the PT is, is basically concentrated in, into few narrow spray of uh, particles. And they, this, this sprays, or that's what we call, call jets. And that's what we see in, in, in the detector. <clears throat> so usually in, in, in such an experiment, a collider experiment, they, Events with uh, big total PT are rather rare, but when they happen, the, the PT is always in, in, in the jets. So, like again, in these two nice two jets, even in, in, in Atlas, you can see this, these two distinct uh, say spray of particles in this direction and this direction. You can see some other activity, but those are the part of the underlying event or, or basically not reconstructable uh, radiation and, and usually very low PT uh, activity. So this, this is what we, we can just naively describe. Okay, we see such an such a object in the detectors and uh, you, you can always ask, okay, why are the, the jets are? What what caused this this phenomenon? Or why this uh, this co co collinear radiation or the collinear spray of particle is more preferred than just filling the whole detector uh, evenly? So if we if we look into the theory, uh, so in this case the QCD, just to understanding what happens at uh, in the in the in in the collision. So if you draw uh, any Feynman graph, so for example, consider just a quark antiquark scattering in, at the LEC. So you might have, uh, okay, two partons coming in, they collide 
and um, you have some products, maybe a quark, uh, two quarks. So actually, they are two quarks. Uh, and uh, they can radiate further gluons and even in the initial state before the hard uh, interaction that happened here you can have uh, some gluon emission and when it happens and if you look into the Feynman graphs you can see there is a propagator here and this propagator is proportional to this uh, 1 over p p2 and plus p p3 squares so that basically what you have or not there sorry here, this is PEA, my, uh, PEA minus P1 square. So that, that's basically the invariant mass of this, this line or this, this you know, virtual, virtual line. So, but when this, uh, these two momenta, the PEA and P1 becomes collinear, so this propagator blows up. And similarly in the final state, when you have a final state emission, so P2, P, P3 becomes collinear. Again, this propagator uh, blows up, so it becomes inf infinity. So of course we have to deal with this infinity later, but uh, that's another issue. But whenever this happens, actually, so th this is a huge wave. So that means the probability of such an emission is big and it's more preferred. And of course, the same thing happens when, say, one of these gluons becomes soft. So that's a, also a kind of preferred uh, uh, radiation pattern. So, but of course, the soft gluons can be it's, uh, hard to detect because it becomes just part of the underlying events, not even reaching the detector. So those are just integrated out. But that's a theoretical issue, hard to deal with them. But the reason why we see all these collinear uh, uh, emissions and these collinear particles in the in the detector, because the because of the the probability is big, this is a preferred uh, way to to radiate uh, more and more particles. Okay, so now of course you you can ask how many jets are there, and how to classify such an event with with jets because. Uh, okay, maybe you, you, you can see like here, maybe a four jet even, uh, but uh, because there are green and uh, orange and blue and uh, red sprays, and it looks like they are, they are jets. But uh, of course, when you ask how many jets, you have to, to somehow quantify, you have to, to understand, okay, what criteria to, to satisfy what you call jet. And that's, that's typically what uh, we call the resolution uh, variable or the resolution of the, of the jets. So we have to always define such a characteristic scale that actually defines your jets. For example, here, well, I, I don't know what was here is actually the criteria, but you can see, okay, I, I, can, I can identify four jets, but if I increase this resolution scale. So that means, uh, well, actually my measurement gets cruder. So I can identify this branch of uh, hadrons here, just one jet instead of three or even four jets. So, so that means, so the number of the jets, what we can see that strongly depends on what is the our resolution. So in, in an experimental, of course, the resolution of the detector can determine this. And the, with a better detector, better resolution, you can see more details uh, in, a, in a, say, a spray of hadrons. But with an old detector or a, a, a cruder detector, you might just identify two jets and that's it. Yeah, so, okay, here is, uh, here is what I was talking about. So if you increase this resolution scale, uh, you see that's, that means you draw a bigger circle and then you have just two jets, what you can, you can rec reconstruct. So, <clears throat> so basically the same picture, uh, but in a more uh, abstract way a little bit. So, but using the, the DAISY uh, H1 detector, actually it's, uh, it's not no longer functioning, but it's a nice nice display. 
So here is a it's a DIS uh, uh, process, and and of course we have an electron. This is the scattered electron. So the electron and the the proton uh, proton coming in they collide, and this is the scattered electron. And then you see lots of uh, hadronic activity here. So when we have just large resolution scale, we identify basically this big fat jet here, and all the other activity is basically part of the beam jet. Those are not uh, resolvable, and it's hard to hard to do any any measurement on that. But of, but when you decrease your your resolution scale, then you can see more more and more substructure in this in this big big pile of. Uh, hadronic activity here in the calorimetry cell. So, okay. So that, that means the number of the jets is really depend on how we define this resolution scale. So that's basically the theory part. So we need some kind of algorithm to, to, <clears throat> to classify events and, and try to try to identify five jets in the final state. And basically that's that theory part. That's we give an algorithm, we, we give a way to, to, to analyze event and basically event by event uh, uh, and, and, and classify, okay, this event, they say it's a three jet event, two jet or four jet. And of course, then you can, you can measure and calculate the cross section. Of course, the other, other thing is the sensitivity of the detector and the angular res resolution of the of the detector, but that's a ex experimental issue, and I'm not sure I can really talk about that, how it is done. But of course, that, that's a kind of, could be a limitation of what you can measure or how precisely you can measure, for example, uh, some substructure in, in the gel. Okay, so, <clears throat> This is what we can see in the detector. This is the phenomena, what you can, you can see, you can observe. And of course, uh, we have to understand from the theory point of view what happens and how to, how to describe, how to, how to cal calculate such a cross-section that actually describes uh, this, this jet, uh, jet event. So let, let's consider a very simple case, uh, E plus E minus, uh, annihilation and um, of course that has a and and let's consider a free jet event and we we would like to see and measure free jet events and and such a measurement has a kind of typical resolution scale and I noted by this this Q whatever it is so you can say okay some kind of 10 GV uh, I, I will I will uh, clarify later what it means so when you consider the theory, the first thing to, to do and the simplest thing to do, let's see what happens on tree level. A simple graph, uh, you have a Z boson decays to quark anti quark and one of the fermion emits a gluon. And since you, you observe free jet, and, uh, and that, that means all these free partons are, are well separated. So that, that means whatever you measure have this Q squared is some kind of uh, either virtuality or transverse momentum, some kind of uh, a reasonable variable, and that basically describes your resolution variable. And that has to be bigger than this, this typical resolution scale of the measurement, this Q squared. And, and, and since you observe free jet, you have free parton, every parton identified as a jet, and uh, all, all this free parton has to be well separated. So this quark and quark has to be well separated from each other. The anti quark and the gluon, and the, the gluon and the quark. Okay, so, so the fir first thing what you need here is you need some kind of hardness variable to, to measure the distance, how far they are from each other. If they are well separated, you know, you know in angle and uh, and rapidity or, or all sort of angle they are far from each other and they are hard enough to be able to observe that's that's the other point okay so <clears throat> but this this is the simplest uh, simplest thing the simplest process but of course uh, in in real life 
is not just one quark or gluon emitted. We cannot even observe quark and gluon. Of course, there are many quarks and many gluons are emitted. So what happens if we add one more radiation? So one more gluon uh, emitted. So, okay, here we have this setup, the original three partons, the, uh, all these black lines, so the quark, anti-quark, and this, this gluon, and they are still well separated, but this extra gluon is radiated from the quark. And uh, you, you can have two scenarios here. Either this extra gluon is also well separated from, from the other partons, and uh, okay, so that, that's fine, that can happen, but then you have a, a, a basically a new jet, a new parton, which can yeah, again develop a, a jet. And so this is this is a four jet uh, process. So it's not a pre jet anymore. And in our measurement, we are not really interested in this. So so we just drop all these events with with four jet. But what happens? Uh, when when this extra gluon uh, gets unresolvable what does it mean when that means this uh, this kind of uh, measure this distance measure is smaller than the typical resolution scale of the of the measurement function of the measurement so that that means for example this gluon becomes too collinear uh, with this quark or maybe this gluon becomes soft Either way, so this, this gluon is not really resolvable, not really distinguishable from the quark because your uh, detector cannot detect quark or gluons, it can, it can see just hadrons. So, so it just becomes basically just a deposit in the calorimetry cells. And that's what you can, what you can see. So it's, you, you cannot detect this extra gluon, it's just part of this basically this quark jet. And, 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 and then of course, yeah, so this is uh, uh, unresolvable, but, uh, and this, this two parton forms a jet, but this jet is well separated from the two other jets. And so this is a free jet event and, and it's really, uh, really nice. We, we consider it in the, in the calculation, but there is another problem. So, this, this gluon becomes uh, unresolvable, so you, you cannot uh, resolve it, you cannot detect it. So you have to integrate out in basically in a cone around the quark, uh, which basically describe this cone by this criteria that either the virtuality or whatever measure you use here has to be smaller than, than, than Q squared. But re remember in this Feynman graph before, this more complicated Feynman graph, there is always a propagator here. And when this gluon becomes very, very collinear or soft, this propagator blows up and, uh, and the integral becomes singular. Okay, so that, that could be a problem. But uh, so we have to deal with this, uh, with this singularity in the theory. Okay, so probably you heard it in the last week from Dave. So that can, it's not really a big problem because we have to also consider virtual, virtual graphs and virtual uh, radiation. And uh, if, you, if you do that, so that would be a corresponding graph to this, this real emission, basically this self-energy graph on this leg. And then a nice thing happens, so you can have some singularity from here, some singularities from here, and when you sum them up, they cancel each other exactly. And, and actually what happens here, uh, so when you sum up all this contribution, uh, you can nicely approximate with the three level graph and changing the decoupling of this, uh, this hard, hard emission and some normalization. So that, 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 that's kind of nice. And we will use later, I will discuss a little bit later this, this property because, uh, okay, we solved the problem of the singularity and the cancellation of the singularity, but we will have some other problem when this Q square becomes small, the typical resolution of the measurement becomes small 
and we can have some logarithmic problem I will discuss later. But what is important here, the singularity has to, all these singularities has to be cancelled. And probably you heard last week that actually these singularities are, are one over epsilon. So in this, in, in this dimensional regula regulation parameter, this epsilon uh, appears and, uh, and they are quite, uh, quite nasty. So they have to be cancelled, all this singularity, and this cancellation has to be ensured by the jet definition. So every measurement, uh, basically jet measurement or any measurement what you, you do at the LEC and the measurement function has to have this infrared safety property. What does it mean? Okay, so <clears throat> the jet algorithm has to be infrared uh, safe. This means uh, it has to be insensitive for any small scale physics. So whenever you have a soft emission or a collinear emission, so basically your measurement function should be blind of that. It, it shouldn't see anything. It just uh, should be basically uh, ignore this, uh, this emission. So, okay, so what, what does it mean? So when we start the, of course, when we try to describe this thing in, in theory, so we have only partons and every parton has momenta. So P1 to Pn. And so <clears throat> when one of these, uh, this gluon or momenta becomes soft, very soft. So the jet measurement function uh, basically should ignore this, this parton. So, so basically, we should get the same uh, same measurement if we just ignore this uh, this uh, this gluon, and then nothing nothing should. So the cross section shouldn't uh, depend basically on this uh, this extra emission. So and the same thing happens for when when these two two partons becomes collinear. So we can just replace by the sum of these two momenta, and uh, and it, it should give the same thing. So I can make it more formal, more mathematical, and probably you see this uh, this cross section formula. So how we calculate cross sections? It's uh, basically sum over all the possible final state, considering the matrix element square, integrating over the phase space, summing over flavors. So this this part, and we insert this jet measurement function. So the the formal definition of the infrared safety when uh, whenever these one parton, so for example, this PM plus one parton becomes uh, is, uh, soft, basically goes to zero, then the measurement function should be exactly the same, or the same should goes to the, the measurement function with one more, uh, with one less parton. And the same thing for the collinear scenario when two of the partons becomes collinear. So that should be the same thing when you have only just m parton. Uh, so measuring m parton, but this, this, these two partons replaced by just one parton, the sum of these two momenta. And, and this, is, this is basically the formal definition of, of the infrared safety. And of course, it should uh, uh, should be true recursively. So when and in this case, so for example, PM uh, P1 and P oh sorry PM becomes zero, that should go to the the same measurement function, with, but with one less parton, and similarly for the for the collinear case. So okay, so this is the kind of formal definition of the infrared safety. And of course, once you have such a measurement function, you can you can do some measurement. And for example, here I consider the the one jet inclusive cross section, and of course they measure this. This is a very famous uh, or very standard uh, measurement at the LEC. And as you can see, so this is the PT distribution of the observed jet, and what is shown here, it's really nice agreement with theory. Okay, so I talked about jets, but I haven't defined them. 
So let's define a JET algorithm. What should be? What should we use? So <clears throat> the JET algorithm, the history traces back to the JET collaboration at Daisy. Actually, this all this the, the JET was first uh, detected and observed at the at Daisy Daisy long time ago, and. In the past, there are two kinds of uh, algorithm was uh, defined and developed. One uh, is called the so-called co so cone algorithm. And that's basically on this intuitive picture. You know, you try to define a cone and see how many, how much uh, hadronic activity you have in this cone. It was kind of intuitive, you know, this kind of what you can see in the detector and try to mimic that. The other is this called uh, successive uh, combination algorithm, and those are uh, those are the most successful algorithm, and I will discuss only them because they are kind of easier to implement, and in the in, from theory point of view, they are uh, better defined. Both can be, uh, of course, they are it has to be infrared safe, but actually in the past happened and the cone algorithm, the original cone algorithm was, was a, a infrared unsafe algorithm. And of course it was later fixed, but uh, it's not that easy to fix. And sometimes in some cases it, it was, it, you had to tweak in order by order the algorithm and you try to, to apply for the theory. From experimental point of view, actually the cone algorithm is a kind of simpler simpler thing and I guess that's why it was used. Okay, so let's talk about this successive uh, combination algorithm. So basically the prototype of this algorithm was the KT, KT jet algorithm. And uh, the first thing, what you have to do, choose an angular resolution parameter. This is the, this is the R. It's kind of related to, a, it's a kind of cone size or or basically similar parameter, although we don't really have cones here, you will see later. So what you, you start with, so basically every part on, or every moment are considered as a protojet. So if you have hundreds of partons in the final state or in the experiment, hundreds of hadron in, in the final state reconstructed. So each of them in the first step, each of them considered as a jet. And, but they are not, not real jets, we, we call it just protojets. And of course we start the empty list of uh, uh, finished jets and those are the, the real jets, what we call jets. And, and the, after the procedure, so the, the result will be a list of jets. Those are this P1, P2, Pn, capital P. And maybe we have some debris as usually soft, uh, 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 junk, and those are just ignored. So how this algorithm look, looks? So it's a five-step algorithm and in a loop. So first, uh, <coughs> consider uh, each pair of protojets and define uh, basically a distance measure between them. So as you can see, this is in this the rapidity distance or pseudo rapidity distance and the azimuthal angle distance. And it's weighted by the minimum of the PT of these two protojets. And uh, here is this R, this uh, uh, angle parameter, this basically the cone size. So uh, you can see when this, uh, when the two protojets becomes collinear, so that means the angle is zero between them. So the rapidity and the and the azimuthal angle is zero between them. So this measure, this dij becomes zero. Or when one of the partons becomes soft, so this, uh, this uh, weight factor, this pt uh, uh, factor becomes, becomes zero. And another, another distance, what you have to define, since it's, this is hadron-hadron collision, so you have to define the distance from the beam. Uh, from the beam pipe. And that's basically, we just measure the PT from the, from the beam, uh, from the beam pipe. 
Okay, so in the next step, uh, consider the, find the smallest of the dijs and di's. So, of course, you have to calculate from each, for each pair of protojets and for each protojet, these, these d quantities. And you, so you find the minimum. So, if the minimum is a pair of this dij, so that means uh, they are really close to each other. So, you have to merge them. So then, then you merge according to some uh, uh, merging uh, procedure. The simplest one is just sum, sum the four momenta up, sum, so add the two, two four momenta. Okay, so in other case, when this uh, uh, measure from the beam pipe is the smallest one, so that, that means it's, uh, yeah, okay, so it's really just a, maybe it's just a, uh, collinear to the beam pipe, so it's very small PT, it's not observed. But anyway, in that case, we consider as a finished jet. Uh, maybe it's a hard jet, maybe it's a, a, just a small PT jet, So, but we add to the, the, the list of finished finish jet. And then in, in the next step, so if we still have a protojet in the list, in the protojet list, we go back to the first step and repeat again and again. So at the end of this procedure, your protojet list is empty and you have a certain number of say finished jets. But some of the jets are uh, hard with kind of uh, reasonable PT or, and many of them has very small PT, couple, maybe one GV or less than one GV or maybe couple of GV. And of course, uh, we don't want to consider them jet because they are not really uh, reconstructable, not really measurable, and and we, we have to apply a P, PT cut at the end, and every jet that uh, satisfies this PT cut, so basically the PT is bigger than this PT cut, are considered a really resolvable and measured jet. Okay, so the name, why the name, so why is the KT algorithm? Because if you look at this uh, this measure, this basically gives you this uh, this KT the transfer the relative transfer momentum between I and J, or, or the hardest and the smallest uh, uh, parton. And uh, yeah, so you can ask, is it infrared safe? Yes, it is infrared safe because if you consider a, a soft emission, and uh, if if the algorithm merges the protojets, then basically when P, PJ becomes zero, so the sum of them becomes just PI. So yeah, basically not, nothing depends on this soft, soft thing. And, and similarly for the, for the collinear emission, when this two becomes collinear, so the in, in immediately this, uh, these two protojets gets merged and then you have a new protojet with this sum of the sum of the free momenta. Okay. So let's see how it looks. So you we, we, you can simulate and you can use this algorithm and computer. So you can generate events. And this was study well a long time ago, 2008, by Kacharisan and so yes. And uh, so they generated uh, many events with Herwig and uh, just and many random soft particles around and see how they perform how they look if it's kind of reasonable what we ex ex expect and what we would like to see or not and th this is this kind of lego plot this uh, this is the rapidity uh, and this is the azimuthal angle and the the vertical axis is the pt and so after you run this, uh, the jet algorithm, so you, it can find certain number of jets, they are color coded. And you see there are some kind of some hard, uh, uh, hard uh, particles and there are lots of soft. And basically each jet just, uh, you know, this, this kind of jet shape, I mean, this is not a kind of cone what you, I mean, naively would like to see but each color basically represents one jet. 
and of course the jet momenta is the sum of all the momenta in this in this area but uh, one interesting thing this is not some kind of circular you know it's not cone like it's very irregular shape uh, what the kt algorithm produces and uh, actually it's not not really a surprise because the kt algorithm has the tendency to suck in this low radiation and and and, and also contam contam contaminate uh, the jet with underlying events so it it even sucks up these uh, soft uh, radiations from the from the beam pipe and it could be a problem to in you know when we try to to tune hadronization models and understand underlying event pile up and all sorts of yeah, sorts of things but of course you can have uh, kind of a different algorithm but in the same same structure but the only difference you change the measure so there is a an cambridge Aachen algorithm so called and in this case the distance measure is is the pure angular uh, uh, measure so you you don't wait with the pt of the protojets and even this uh, the distance from the from the beam pipe is is actually fixed it's just one so it it on, only the angle counts and well in this case of course it gives something it's still an infrared safe algorithm because when it's collinear you see the the, the dij gets uh, zero when two of them collinear and immediately gets merged if it's soft then it will be reco reco recognized as a finished jet. But since we, we have a PT cut on, on the jets, so it becomes immediately part of the beam, uh, beam pipe. So we, we don't care about them, we just ignore them. So <clears throat> that's fine. Uh, you, can, you can simulate them and you can see it has also some kind of regular shape uh, of the jets. It's not really circular. Of course, it doesn't have to, but uh, yeah, maybe some exper from experimental point of view, it's maybe it's a, a better idea to, to try to find such an algorithm because it's more intuitive. And I, actually, you can you can tweak further the distance measure, and this is the so-called anti-KT algorithm, and I think this is the most popular at the LEC. To use the only difference now this uh, this distance measure is weighted by the minimum of the inverse of the pts and uh, and also the from the beam pipe uh, the measure is the uh, inverse of the the pt of the of the port protojet um what does it do so again this is uh, this is infrared safe uh, because the colon collinear uh, always gets combined and uh, and the soft stuff is just ignored at the end um, but it, it's kind of nice because it actually gives you this uh, kind of circular cone-like structure so what you what you intuitively uh, like to see and uh, and the reason is that because the anti-KT algorithm actually the highest PT protojet has the priority to absorb these the nearby soft uh, soft protojets and uh, yeah it's kind of, kind of interesting that uh, has nice regular kind of circular structure okay so basically these are the algorithms are mostly used at the at the LEC and in LEC analysis and I think this uh, anti KT is really preferred because it has some kind of uh, goodies to uh, from respect to, to, to the hadronization model and underlying events. Okay, so, <clears throat> so you can use this algorithm and any jet algorithm, and of course you can measure something and you can calculate. So I, I go to the, the more theory direction from now. So, but um, 
usually when we calculate, we, we do fixed order calculation. And, and that's, that's a systematic way to, to, to make QCD prediction. And the, in the best case, we can do next to leading order. Sometimes we can do next to next to leading order uh, calculation. And for higher order, it's not really. At, for, 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 for jet, uh, jet cross section. And, and if you do the next to leading order calculation, for example, in this example, uh, we have two, two photon plus one jet inclusive cross section. And we, we plotted the, the PT of the, di, uh, the, the two photons, the di photon uh, system. And you can see the leading order cross section looks like this. And uh, so the, the PT of the jet is required to be 40 GV. And uh, so this, this is the first order calculation and the red one is the second order calculation. And actually uh, here at 40, 40 GV, so basically the calculation breaks down. And, and why? So in, in this case, these, uh, the characteristic scale of the measurement is, is this one. It's basically the PT of the uh, of the diphoton system minus 40 GV square. And, um, <clears throat> and what happens here at uh, 40 GV, so the NLO distribution becomes discontinuous and actually becomes singular. So it looks uh, finite because of the beam smearing effect, but on, from this part, uh, it, uh, it goes to, to infinity from this part, it goes to, to minus infinity. So, so in this case, the, actually the perturbative calculation breaks down. So, and, and what happens here? So, you know, in, in the perturbative calculation, we, we, we use the alpha as an as a expansion parameter. But in, in this region, actually the effective expansion parameter becomes the alpha s times the log square. Log square, which is the, oh, sorry, it's a mistake. It should be uh, mu j square, uh, this, this q square. Uh, uh, okay, so I guess I messed up something in the slide here. But, uh, but th that's a problem because this log becomes big. So, so when this, uh, this PT uh, gets closer and closer to 40 GV, this mu J becomes zero and this log becomes, uh, it becomes an infinity, becomes large. And, and of course the alpha still can be, well, it's not really small anymore, but uh, because it's also running, but yeah, so you can consider as a small thing, but together this factor is, is actually order one or even bigger. So that's the problem. And, and that means the, the perturbation theory breaks down and the effective uh, uh, expansion parameter is not the alpha S anymore. So, okay, what happens then? If, if, you, if we go back to our, our little picture, of course we have the cancellation of the singularities, but uh, what we do actually, so, so you, you, you can mimic this, uh, this configuration or this, this sum, these two contribution and real and virtual, we just basically replacing by the tree graph and rescale it and changing the run, running of the R pass. And when, when this, the resolution scale or this, this typical, uh, resolution scale of the measurement uh, becomes very, very small, the alpha S blows up and this, this logarithm blows up. And, 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 and of course that's a problem because we, we cannot predict. And to, 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 to solve this problem, well, just to, to see how it, it's bad, if you consider the running alpha S that also has a very strong logarithmic dependence on the scale. So when you go to the smaller and smaller scale, even the alpha gets very, very big and, uh, and everything is out of control. And this, this is just one emission. So, so what happens if you actually you have more than one emission? So you have to consider more than one in, 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 in a jet. 
So it can happen, okay, here is an unresolved uh, gluon, but that can spread further, either quark or gluons can be emitted from the gluon or further gluons can be emitted from this quark. And all of them becomes uh, unresolvable, so you have to integrate out. And of course, the singularities cancel each other, that's, uh, that's guaranteed. But, uh, <clears throat> but the cross-section will be dominated by this large logarithm of the this jet resolution scale or the typical uh, scale of the of the measurement and of course you have this large logarithm and if you have more and more emission actually the power of course the alpha s power is growing but this this the log square power is is is, is appears at every alpha s so it's get it, it, it's getting even worse at higher and higher order. So that's the problem. And, and no matter how many orders you calculate, so you can, okay, you say, okay, this is a problem and next to leading order, well, let's calculate one more order, next to next to leading order. First of all, it's really hard to calculate next to next to leading order or even higher, but uh, it, it will appear the same problem but of course it's alpha square, but you have a, a, a very high power of this of the same logarithm. So whenever you truncate, this problem will be there. So we have to find some solution for this, and 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 we, we have to sum up such a such a large logarithm. And that's the idea. And before we well, I won't give you any uh, details how to sum them up. I just want to to show the origin of this logarithm, where it comes from, how, why do we have such a problem in the, in the calculation. So uh, I, I need some notation because it's really hard to work with such a, such a big expression like this. But you remember at the beginning of talk, this is how I defined the cross section. So matrix element square, measurement operator, measurement function, integrating over all the final state, momentum, and flavor, and summing up all the possible final state. And this is how we calculate cross section. So we have some kind of uh, abstract notation, some linear algebra notation, and this is the color code how you can translate. So all this green stuff is basically in this state and this row mu squared that describes a partonic state. Basically, you sum up all the possible final state and provide all the possible um, matrix elements, what you need, not just three level, any any loop level uh, matrix element. And so it, basically think, think about a, a, a partonic state with many partons. And of course you have a, if you have a partonic state, you can make a measurement and you need the operator of the, that measurement. This is this OJ. And, uh, and of course, every measurement has a typical uh, resolution scale or a typical uh, scale, a characteristic scale. And all this integral is basically in this one state, this uh, bra state. So integrating over momentum flavors. So you don't really have to understand the details of this notation. Uh, it, it, it's not important here. But you have to understand there is a way to translate such a cross-section formula in, into, into this very compact form. Okay, so probably you saw it uh, in the last week, the how to calculate text to reading order cross-section. And uh, yeah, so basically you have the, the Born level, you have the real radiation minus the subtraction. And the subtraction is defined as a born times a, a singular factor over this uh, unresolved uh, uh, phase space or, or over the phase space of the unresolved parton. And what you what you do basically you subtract everything uh, when when a radiation happens under a certain scale. So this mu square is typically the renormalization scale here. And uh, when you have a uh, extra gluon emission, say it's more collinear than this scale or more soft than, than this scale, you basically you subtract something. It, what you subtract is nice because that has universal structure. So I guess you, 
you heard it in the previous lecture. But of course, when you subtract something, you have to add it back. Otherwise, you change your cross section. And uh, but when we add it back, we integrate out analytically over this unresolved phase space, and then uh, we can manage to 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 cancel the singularities. And and probably you saw it in in the last week and in in many conference talk or or workshop talks. This is this is kind of usual formula to show. If I want to write it in a kind of this more general and more abstract way, so you see this part basically corresponds to the subtraction part, and I have the born state, and I have the here combined real and virtual, and I subtract the singularities either for the real and the virtual, some some kind of universal singular operator times the born uh, state. And of course, when you add it back, you have to somehow add it back. And uh, and this this is the part when I add it back. Uh, the, this uh, this singular operator, this is a singular operator. But when I integrate over the final, the unresolved phase space, the singularities cancel each other, and that's ensured by the, of course, the the. Kinoshita Lee theorem and, and, and the infrared safety of, of the observable. So if you if you expand this expression in alpha s and, and keep only the born term and the alpha s correction, basically you, you you get back the same formula. But you have to keep in mind in this D operator, I have uh, real and virtual subtraction. So I treat the the singularities um, uh, equally. So both of them, I have some subtraction because, because uh, the matrix elements has factorization property, not only for the three level, but also for the loop, loop graphs. And so if you want to write this even more uh, uh, general, more abstract way, actually you have to realize this, is, uh, this can be written in a multiplicative way. Uh, here, if you go back, it looks like a kind of additive but if you work higher and higher order, you can see the pattern. And actually, it turns out you can write it in a multiplicative way, this procedure. So, so you define a basically a universal singular operator that describes all the singularities of your QCD matrix element. And that's process independent. That doesn't depend on if you are interested in pure jet uh, cross section or Higgs plus jet. It, it, it's independent of that. It basically describes only the soft and collinear emission, higher and order by order. And if you work higher and higher order, of course, you have more and more complicated operators. But uh, <clears throat> but the nice thing, because of the factorization property of well, QCD, uh, you can factorize that as a factor instead of uh, using this additive way. It's a little bit similar like in the renormalization. You can write the renormalization either uh, additive uh, uh, form or, or multiplicative form. But then, but the nice thing, uh, once you, this D operator basically mimics all the singularity of your matrix element or matrix element squares. Uh, and you can use this D operator to provide subtraction. And that's nothing else, just the inverse of this D operator. The, what the, the important thing, this is finite in, in four dimension, and it's, it, you can always calculate. And, uh, and all the singularities in this red, red stuff after, after you, you combine the, your matrix elements, the matrix element square with this, uh, with this D operator, the inverse of the D operator. And, and you remember this one state is always takes care about the integrals over the unresolved phase space. And when you do this integral, this is, this is always finite because the cancel, singularity is canceled between the real and virtual. Okay, so now th this is when you do fixed order calculation. And what is the problem here? The problem because remember that B operator can create partons because it contains the real singularities. So they're a real emission. 
it can can create uh, one part or not even more if you work higher and higher order but if you work just first order level this basically describes just a single gluon emission added to a, a, a certain parton you see the higher order of course gives more partons so but but this d operator depends on the renormalization scale uh, yeah there are some details but it's not important at the moment so that means this d operator creates a new parton only so those are unresolvable unresolvable above this new scale so when, when it emits a gluon that's always is, is the virtuality of this gluon or the pt or whatever is is, is always smaller than this mu square. So that means it, if, if the mu square is very, very small, that means that the D operator always creates a very, very collinear or a very, very soft parton. Okay, so so now what happens? So we would like to keep this, this uh, when you do the perturbative calculation, you have to always truncate in alpha. So you cannot do at all order level. So <clears throat> when you truncate, you want to maintain the, the accuracy of the calculation. And if we, we concern here, so, so what happens here? This D operator emits a parton. If, if this, this emission is kind of hard, that's resolvable by the measurement operator, you see? So, and, and why is it problem? Because this D operator is just the approximation, you know, of the, of the exact matrix element or the singular structure of the exact matrix element. So if, my, if, if the jet measurement function can resolve something, well, it can, can be a problem. So, because it sees something, but I don't have the, the good uh, prescription. So it's just the approximation. So the idea, is to, to try to keep this scale as small as possible because then the D operator emits only very, very soft and very, very collinear, and the measurement function is insensitive to this emission. So it cannot see anything. If it cannot see anything, that means you can commute this, these two things, and that means your cross section won't uh, depend on strongly on this soft or collinear emission. And you remember when you have such a very, very soft or very, very cold in our emissions that can lead to, to this, this large logarithm. So, so when, when, we, when we choose the renormalization scale, if you look at this part of the cross section, that, that uh, says it wants to, be, uh, wants to be a small scale. It's much smaller scale than the, the resolution of the measurement. But if you look at from the other side, from the hard part, the hard part is, uh, is process dependent and we want to keep it perturbative because we cannot calculate higher and higher order, really just next to leading order in most of the cases. So this scale here, it says the, the renormalization scale has to be, be big, like Q squared. And this is the conflict because you cannot have two renormalization scale in, in one calculation. So you cannot use a different renormalization scale in the soft part and you cannot use a different in the, in the hard part. And this, this is a conflict and how to solve this. And, and actually this is the origin of this, uh, this large logarithm uh, because when you truncate, it always develops this large logarithm in your, in your characteristic scale. And to solve this problem, actually, we have to sum up this large logarithm. Basically, you have to find uh, an evolution between a hard scale. You know, the hard state is defined at, at the hard scale, and the soft part is defined on a very low scale, usually 1 GV, which is good enough to, you know, uh, it's much smaller than the typical measurement scale. And, and this, this evolution between these two scale, actually the part of shower, or if you do analytic calculation, this, this will be your analytic uh, resummation. Okay, so this part was probably a little bit abstract, but I think it's a, it's a nice way to illustrate where all this large logarithm problem comes from and, uh, and why you have to really consider either 
uh, resum calculation or or Parton shower if it's good enough. And uh, and it also shows the limitation of the fixed order calculation because if you cannot do resummation or or good Parton shower to to sum up this uh, large logarithm at all order level. So you have to choose a scale, uh, something uh, something like big, because no, you don't have other choice. But that means this scale has to be the big, and it means that the measurement what you can do it's typically kind of large characteristics at large characteristic scale. So that and most of the interesting physics comes when the the typical scale of the measurement is rather small. Okay, so let me conclude very quickly. Yeah, QCD gives jets, and jets are real and seen in experiments, so that's not just uh, uh, our imagination. Uh, to measure a jet cross section, and of course, to, to, to predict and calculate jet cross section, we need careful definition of the jet algorithm. At LEC, we use uh, mostly use successive uh, combination algorithms such as KT, Cambridge, Ahan, and anti KT. Uh, of course, the definition has to be uh, infrared safe. There is no other option. Uh, and uh, because infrared safety allows us to make, make uh, uh, prediction at uh, either fixed order level or uh, even summing up uh, to uh, large logarithm by shower or analytical calculation. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, so appreciate that. Um, if there are any quick questions, we have a time for that. Um, and uh, if so, just raise your hand or unmute. And uh, let me also, again, just remind folks uh, we will have a break and on the half hour, we will start the tutorials and the tutorials will be in the gather town rooms and the uh, room numbers are on the, uh, on the timetable. So, uh, okay, very good. Um, okay, so I don't see any hands or other things at the moment, but yeah, that was a very good overview. And uh, again, if you have questions, uh, you can bring them this evening to the recitation section. And uh, so, uh, Zoltan, thank you again, and we'll see folks at the half hour. So, take care. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Very.